Hi, I'm Michelle Adabato. The North Ward Center is committed to educating the public about the importance of community programs that give all New Jersey residents a chance for a better life. That's why we're proud to support the important educational programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Wells Fargo, Passaic County Community College, New Jersey Council of County Colleges, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, the Give Something Back Foundation, providing mentors and scholarships to help Pell Grant eligible students go to college and graduate in four years debt free, and by the North Ward Center. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Family Magazine and NJFamily.com. And by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. I'm Steve Adubato. It is my pleasure to introduce for the first time with us Cam Wong, who is Vice President, Diversity and Inclusion, Prudential Financial, and good to see you, Cam. Thank you. Likewise. Um, let's talk about um, the issue of uh, disabilities and the fact that there was a major event in Newark that we'll be showing some video of that was historic in many ways. Describe it. Yeah, so we were very excited at Prudential to host our disability awareness celebration in Military Park on October 18th. Um, and basically what we did was we brought this amazing first ever disability rights museum on wheels. Hold um, on, the disability rights museum yeah, on wheels. wheels? Exactly. It's a 48 foot trailer that's pulled by a truck. And within this trailer is a curated exhibit of the uh, progress, the movement for civil rights for people with disabilities. Okay, so, make it clear to us. Sure. Civil rights for people with disabilities, right. for example. So unfortunately, it started with the dark times with eugenics and forced sterilization and institutionalization of people with disabilities. And then marching through time where there had been the fight and the, the struggle for equal access and equal opportunities for people with disabilities, including a time in the 80s where uh, wheelchair users um, and people using um, canes uh, you know, abandoned them and literally crawled up the steps of the Capitol building to really be visible and not be you know, secreted and hidden away to fight for their right to education, to access in public places. I mean, our country, even as recent as the 1970s, had what was called ugly laws. Hold on a minute. Ugly, ugly laws. Ugly laws. Okay. What does yes, that mean? sure. So, these laws in um, in many states until the mid 1970s uh, allowed public establishments like restaurants to turn away someone because they were unsightly, because they, you know, didn't look as um, the restaurant might want them to look. They could turn them away. They can turn them away legally. Legally, and they could be arrested, even. The and, person? Yes, the person can be kicked out of the establishment. Yeah. So a, a restaurant can call up the police to right. escort the person physically away. Okay, so I don't want to say fast forward because I, that's such an inappropriate expression right now. But if we were to talk about the progress we've made, right. how would you describe where we are today? So I would say that we've made good progress, but it's not nearly where it needs to be. Um, what are we missing? So I think the future state ideally would be universal design, where, for instance... Universal design. Exactly. Where we would think to have curb cuts as a matter of course, so that someone using a wheelchair can easily, you know, move around. Um, we curb will, cuts. Curb cuts, exactly. And universal design, the whole notion about it is that it helps everybody not just a person with disabilities. So the, some, the, um, the parent pushing the mm. stroller, someone with the luggage um, that they're pulling. So why, so hold on, so here's what I'm curious about. So is that about building code? Is that about saying that a building has to be designed in that way and if it's not designed in that way, there's some sort of fine? No, is it's- Is that government policy? Well, I would say it's beyond that. It's really embedding inclusion through- Inclusion. Inclusion of people with disabilities 
which would then serve everyone. Um, a lot of buildings are meeting to meeting the, the code standards. The ADA code. Right. Not enough. Exactly. So this is more of a cultural, like who are we going to be as a society? Yes. Are we going to be inclusive? Or are we going to simply meet the standards of the Americans with Disabilities Act and that's it because right. the government can't give us a hard time if we don't? I mean, I don't want to oversimplify it, right. but am I right? Yes. I mean, we really want to build to a culture and a climate where we are inclusive of people with disabilities across all dimensions, in the workplace, in the marketplace, in the community. And when we had the celebration at a military park in Newark, um, it was for that purpose, to get the conversation yeah. going. Um, at Prudential, describe what you're doing. Uh, so my responsibility chiefly is to ensure equal access and equal opportunities for all, um, and really ensure the integration of diversity and inclusion within that. Um, so for instance, um, creating the climate where people feel they can really bring the full selves to work. Mm -hmm. So especially invisible disabilities. Invisible disabilities. Yes. Uh, about 71% of disabilities are not visible. So disabilities such as Asperger or hearing impairment, um, learning disabilities, um, things of that sort, post-traumatic stress disorder. You wouldn't see it. Exactly. Or you wouldn't necessarily see it. Right. And we want to create the climate where people feel that they can really bring the full selves to work, where they don't have to hide, they don't have to cover. Um, and that they will then fully avail themselves of uh, the productivity tools that we can provide for them. Um, so someone, for instance, with a hearing impairment, that they would feel comfortable coming forward saying that they have a hearing impairment, and then we can provide them the technology that will enable them to be fully engaged in the workplace and fully productive. The technical legal term they use is disability accommodation, yeah. but I like to see it as really enabling um, all our people to fully be engaged and fully succeed. Before I let you go, I'm curious about this. As a society, in terms of our attitudes, how close do you think we are to truly, not just accepting, but embracing people who happen to have disability, a disability? I think, unfortunately, we are still a distance um, from there. Um, I think we still have quite a journey to travel but having these kind of conversations and being able to be out of Military Park where they see this trailer. That was a big deal. Biggest accomplishment from that day, Biggest from that celebration. About 500 people stopping through the museum and learning about the progress over time and the struggle for equal rights for people with disabilities. That's a big deal. It is. And if people wanted to find out more, what would they do? Um, they could uh, connect up with um, USBLN that uh, created the Museum on Wheels. Cam Wong is the Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion at Prudential Financial. Cam, thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Stay with us. We'll be right back. To watch more Caucus New Jersey, find us online and follow us on social media. We are pleased to be joined once again by our good friend Micheline Davis, Executive Vice President and Chief Corporate Affairs Officer of RWJ Barnabas Health. Good to see you. You too. Micheline, the initiative I want to talk to you about is, is called the Social Impact and Community Investment Initiative that your organization is a part of and has something to do with why we're here today. We're actually doing a program here in Newark at the North Ward Center dealing with police minority relations, one of the many um, very community-oriented dialogues and initiatives that you're a part of. Talk about it. Oh, absolutely. So really excited um, uh, to author the social impact and community investment practice for RWJ Barnabas Health. Steve, this came really out of the visionary uh, of our uh, president and CEO. I cannot ever help but smile when I think about him. Barry Ostrowski, as you know, um, is an individual who fully understands that as a healthcare institution, that is the breadth and, and, and width of RWJ Barnabas Health, that we would be remiss if, in fact, we attempted to ever think that we were just supposed to be in a community but not of that community. Uh, as What's a result, the difference? Oh, my goodness. Well, the difference is that, that you um, simply do what it is that uh, you have to do, right? So what we know is that we are there in order to render uh, high quality clinical care to the people who come through our door. But what if we decided that we were going to go outside that door? Mm. 
and that we were not simply going to go outside the door to do health screenings, which is incredibly important at health fairs and, and other venues. But what if we began to, to literally look at, well, what are the social determinants that cause you to be a patient of ours in a chronic manner, right? So, so if, in fact, you are an individual who consistently comes in through our ER or who we consistently see for a variety of things, perhaps we need to have a conversation around what are the other things that are going on in your life? And how can we better assist you in managing through this lifetime by ensuring that we have connected the right collaborative partners and shored up the right resources to make certain that we're addressing certain things? Let me give you an example. So we can talk about the fact that, well, the, the thing that costs us the most in healthcare is poverty, and then throw up our hands and go away, right? Or we can take a look at the fact that actually the unemployment rate in certain urban environments is outrageously high. But that's the role of a healthcare organization? Why is it not the role of a healthcare organization? It's a role of, of any anchor institution. And so I really think that what our leader has done is, is made certain that we do more than just that which is required as a nonprofit healthcare system. We know that the IRS commands that we um, literally do community benefit. We get that. As a nonprofit. As a nonprofit. But what if we were to actually realize the fact that we are here in the communities where we serve for not five years, not 10 mm -hmm. years. We're not a, a local right bank branch. We are in oftentimes uh, in the communities where we have a hospital, we've been there a hundred years, see. We employ a great deal of those individuals, and of course we treat those families, our own neighbors and friends, but we could be more than that. What if we decided to utilize our, oh I don't know, our procurement vehicle in order to do some local spending to ensure that the vendors and the small businesses within the communities where we are, are situated are actually brought into our institution and thereby we're also bringing some economic stimulus to the environments where, where we're serving. What if we decided that it's not just enough to, to recruit national experts, but what if we also turned an eye toward ensuring that we are helping to do something about that high rate of unemployment? You mean employ people in the community? You got it. I mean, let me ask you this, devil's advocate. Someone says, well, you do that, you know, anecdotally. Like, why does it have to be an initiative where it's concerted, it's consistent, it's focused, or does it really have to be that? Oh, well, we think it does, and I will tell you this. One of the reasons why we believe that it does is because of the fact that if, in fact, we, we only do it in an episodic manner, then that is all it will ever be, right? If we, no real impact. <laughs> you got it. If we literally decide, well, we're going to actually do this with a strategy and a laser focus so that we are truly moving the needle in this space, if we just leave it up to individuals to do it on their own, listen, it's a good thing to do, right? Mm. It may make folks feel good, but it will never truly have the positive societal impact that we believe that we can make. Since Barnabas came together with RWJ and it becomes RWJ Barnabas Health, the community engagement, does it become more challenging when the footprint becomes that big? So really incredibly important. So one of the things that um, we noticed when we were uh, literally just kind of courting each other before we, we got married as a system was the fact that we had very similar cultures. And one of the incredible elements about those cultures really had to do with the fact that on both sides of the house, we had a depth of commitment in the area of community health education and community outreach. So we have two large scale systems doing very well within their own communities being very well entrenched in those communities in order to have great community partners. So in coming together, it wasn't an issue of how difficult it would be, but it did give us the opportunity to ask, who do we want to truly be to the audience that we serve? So I want to understand something. Play this out for example. Sure. You're good with examples very often. So um, I'm a Rutgers uh, guy. You know Rutgers well, right? Mm -hmm. New Brunswick, right? RWJ Barnabas Health, very committed to that community, particularly New Brunswick. Absolutely. What would this engagement, this initiative you're talking about, mean in a community like New Brunswick, per se? <laughs> well, New Brunswick is such an interesting uh, area because we have such an incredible partnership with Rutgers in New Brunswick. Um, but we have a very wonderful uh, partnership that's brewing right now with Rutgers Newark as well. Um, and so here's one particular thing. Um, and you can pick up the, the headlines and you will see that we recently announced a, a partnership with their um, uh, sports complex where we are literally bringing in uh, sports medicine. We're going to be 
working together in order to recruit national leaders in that particular space and making certain that we are, are creating that which is a much more formalized process to really uh, take New Jersey to the forefront in sports medicine, right? So it looks like that in, in one section. And in another section, it looks like that which we have with the uh, faculty member who is in charge of the public-private partnership for all of Rutgers University. It including means, in Camden. Including in Camden. It Your hometown. It, you got it. It means that we have research fellows who are assigned to our facilities who come in and in an environment like that, which um, I know that we've done with you before, around community dialogue, right? That's right? We help to usher in a form and a format of community healing by ensuring that we are orchestrating the convening where we're having safe space for community dialogue around difficult issues, whether or not that is the epidemic of diabetes in black right. and brown communities, or whether or not it's something like building trust with police forces in those communities. Which you argue, uh, I know we're limited on time, but building trust, police minority relations that we just had, you argue is a public health issue. It is a public health issue. Listen, you cannot tell me that feeling safe in your community is not a public health issue. It impacts your stress level, which impacts your hypertension. It impacts the way in which you prioritize um, mm -hmm. uh, the needs of your family. It undoubtedly is a public health mm -hmm. issue. That when there's violence in communities, we see these communities suffer from PTSD far and wide. And yet, we want to act as if they get to wake up tomorrow morning, <laughs> right? Eat their morning cereal and go off to school. That is not healthy, Stephen. And so one of the things that we're hoping to do is through that partnership is to ensure that we have fellows who are acting as scribers and, and producing papers around this work. We're going to begin to develop toolkits that will then help other communities in other states and perhaps one day other nations on how to bring about community healing. Micheline Davis from RWJ Warner Bissell, thank you so much. Thank you. Well said. We'll be right back right after this. To see more Caucus New Jersey with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Tim Hogan is a teacher at Howell High School that has um, one of the largest autism spectrum disorder support programs in the state of New Jersey. Tim, good to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Tim, we're about to see a video, um, part of the Classroom Close-Up series produced by the New Jersey Education Association. Um, you're closely connected and committed to this initiative. Um, connected to autism because? I have a child who's severely autistic, and this whole program all started because we've had some really bad experiences, our family, because he has autism. And one night, I was on the boardwalk down the Spring Lake along the shore, and a lot of people, my son was having a behavior because dogs were being running loose, people were breaking the law, basically. And everyone kept telling me, oh, it's okay, it's okay, the dog's fine. Well, it wasn't fine. You were really blowing up his world. And I ended up having to drag him off the boardwalk in a headlock. And everyone just stopped and stared. And I could hear people saying things about what a brat he was and what a bad parent I was. And that night, I went home and called this woman. I work with Mary Collins. And she has a group called the Any Towners. And they um, are about getting diversity in the schools. Mm. And I called her, and we, um, we started this assembly. So why don't we do this? Why don't we take a look at this video? We'll come back and talk. Because uh, I happen to know, as we know, the classroom close up people put together some powerful stories, and here it is right now. Imagine that people may laugh at you because you act differently. Imagine that you may physically attack your family and teachers for reasons you cannot explain. Student peer leaders at Howell High School are spending a day speaking with their classmates to promote autism awareness and acceptance during National Autism Awareness Month. It's very important, especially uh, students in our school where we do have an autism program and we do interact with uh, children with autism, it's important to know how to interact with them. So that's why we, we really put this together. Howell is home to one of the largest high school autism spectrum disorder support programs in New Jersey. Do not stare or laugh at someone with autism just because they act differently, and do not put your arm around or hug someone with autism. Instead, offer a high five, handshake, or fist bump. 
Along with information, the students present short films that have connections to the school, including interviews with siblings of autistic students and a discussion with teachers who work in the ASD program. Though perhaps the most personal connection comes from business teacher Tim Hogan, who shares his family's story. It is so isolating. Hogan became the driving force behind Howell's awareness program six years ago, following a challenging experience involving his son, Sean, who is on the autism spectrum. That night, I happened to be down on the boardwalk walking with my son, and some dogs were going by, and they started barking, and my son has issues with that, and he got up visibly upset, and everyone stopped and stared. The experience was not an isolated one, and Hogan decided he needed to do something to educate people how to interact with autism. So he reached out to fellow teacher Mary Collins about recruiting the peer leader group she advises, known as the Anytowners, to help inform the entire Howe community about autism. The Anytowners are nine seniors who were picked by the principal and myself, and we saw that these were the students in the school who really stood out as far as their leadership skills and their ability to make an inclusive environment in Howell High School. Hogan is deeply involved in the awareness efforts. During assemblies, he shares intimate details of his family's life through stories and a short film titled Autism Island. There's been so many horrendous things that have happened to my son and our family because he has autism. It was one of those horrendous things that sparked Howell's latest awareness initiative, asking students to take a pledge. And we can start by pledging to not say the R word or retard. That incident inspired the creation of a social media campaign and video that has drawn significant attention to the cause. Last year we launched this campaign. We had 190,000 views on Facebook all over the world. Australia, England, Ireland, most of the U.S. states, all over Canada. So I, I do believe we're making a difference there. What's been the reaction? Oh, it was tremendous. The R word video, um, I don't hear it anymore from the kids just putting that out there about how, how hurtful that is. Because, you know, you hear high schoolers talk, that just becomes part of their vocabulary. You know, instead of saying something stupid, they use the R word. And it really, I just don't hear it anymore. I used to hear it dozens of times a day. Explain to the rest of us, everyone watching right now, why it hurts so much. Because, he, to me, you're making fun of my son. You're making fun of anyone who has a physical or mental disability. Every time I hear that, I'm like, you're making fun of someone. It, you know, mental retardation is a diagnosis. And we have lessened it because of that slang term. But it's it, not funny, is it? Not at all. Not at all. And it's, it's hard. it really hurts me every single time I so hear it. So those of us who have used it and think we don't mean anything need to step back. Words matter. Words absolutely matter, and that's one of the words that really matter. And there's so many other words that can be used, and that was part of what we were trying to tell our students. Let's use something else. Um, your son's experience slash your family's experience, how has it changed you? Uh, it's, uh, honestly, I wish I never knew what autism was, because it is brutal to watch my son not have a normal life. He's never going to have, he doesn't have any friends. He's never going to live independently. He's going to be with my wife and I till the day he dies. And then from there, it's a huge question. I don't know where it goes from there. You know, there's, there's not a lot of funding. I go to a lot of seminars to find out about it. So it, 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 my whole life is autism. Where I live, where I work, I, I had a partner. I was a partnership, partner in an accounting firm on Wall Street. I gave it all up because, because of my son. So you're, you're saying that he won't be able to interact with other people? He, he goes, no, no. He, his vocabulary is very, not his vocabulary, his ability to speak is like mm. a three-year-old. Yeah. Um, he gets very aggressive. Like in the video, you saw him ha with these blue headphones on. No matter yes. where we go, he wears headphones. So we now have him wearing these headphones uh, that have music in them. So they don't look as like there's something wrong with them. Yeah. Um, he wears them all the time out anytime we're outside the house because he's got so many issues. You know, like the local fire department, they were so great. The fire whistle was going off and it would send my son into a tizzy and he put holes in walls. He would physically come after me. I went to them, went to one of their meetings and they were super. They, they turned the fire whistle off for they us. They cared. Yeah, and then now we're doing it through, through electronic. What is it that, if you could send one message to everyone else right now, other than what you said about the R word, what's the message to all of 
those watching, all of us. People with autism are people. They never ask for this. They were born with this developmental disorder. And they're not doing anything wrong in life. And if you see someone where you think, oh, maybe he's a brat, whatever, no, think about it. It may be something else. And show some compassion to these people because people with autism are the most genuine people in the world. Like My son has attacked me. I can't even tell you how many times. But he's the most genuine piece, pe person in the world. There's no hatred in him. There's no bigotry. There's none of that. People with autism don't have that. They are just the most honest, genuine people in the world. And you've got to know where they are at all times. So we just assume, and we're often wrong. You assume? We assume when someone acts a certain way, we know why, and we don't very often. True, absolutely. You just assume, well, it's because the kid's a brat or, or an adult. I mean, and we're seeing the population of people with autism is just growing, and we're going to have adults doing yeah. these type of things. Tim Hogan is a uh, teacher at Howell High School, which has one of the largest autism spectrum disorder support programs in the state of New Jersey and in the nation. Um, you're making a big difference. You just made a diff big difference now. Thank you, Tim. Thank you for having me. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence and 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Wells Fargo, Passaic County Community College, New Jersey Council of County Colleges, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, the Give Something Back Foundation, and by the North Ward Center. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. How do you create change? By cultivating hope. And we see that every day. In the eyes of our preschoolers, in the souls of the seniors in our adult day program, in the minds of the students at Robert Treat Academy, a national blue ribbon school of excellence, in the passion of children in our youth leadership development program, in our commitment to connections at the Center for Autism, and in the heart of our community the North Ward Center, creating opportunities for equity, education, and growth.